Hello everyone, my name is Bernardo Perez Priego. I'm a firmware engineer at Intel and I'm part of the Chrome Platform Engineering team. We work in collaboration with Google engineers to provide support for new Chrome devices and features. Most of my contributions are on the platform embedded controller. Today I will be talking about the application processor power sequence subsystem. Thanks for joining. In today's agenda, um, I would like to start by providing some background about what Chrome OS Embedded Controller is and what is the application processor power sequence. This will be followed by describing the motivation for bringing this proposal. Then uh, we'll get an overview of this subsystem. I will also talk about the how to provide implementation for this subsystem and describe the user interface that is exported. Finally, I will give a summary of this proposal. Let's start. So this will provide some background for a couple of concepts that I mentioned. What is the Chrome OS Embed Controller? Well, it's a microcontroller that is found on the platform and manages the its hardware and power delivery. Uh, assists the application processor, for, shorter for AP, in many low-level tasks. You can think of the AP as the main processor in the platform, and it's also known as the SOC for its acronyms uh, system on chip. And it has much more capabilities and resources compared to the embedded controller. Uh, this is the one that uh, runs the Chrome OS where applications like Gmail and YouTube are executed. Those tasks that I was uh, mentioning uh, include the battery and charger management, uh, thermal management and communication ports enablement. It also handles the AP power sequencing. This is the way uh, the power states of the AP uh, are swiftly driven uh, to power, power it up, power it down, uh, send it to suspend and wake it up from suspend. This is also one of the first components that uh, in the platform that receives power. AP power sequence consists of multiple uh, stages of power state transition. Uh, on each state, different voltage rails uh, will be turned on using uh, control signals from the AP. Uh, the platform responds by ramping the required voltage and the required order to assert corresponding power good signals uh, required by the AP and other platform components after certain timing requirements uh, have been met. Um, here on the right side, it's a very simplified diagram to show how the power signals are directed. Uh, we see uh, different voltage rails supplying power to various components uh, in the platform. These voltage rails are controlled by corresponding uh, voltage converters. Uh, note that EC is involved in many of these power signals, either by driving them or by monitoring its state. So that, that way EC uh, knows what is the current power state of the AP and it ensures that it's pro pro providing the uh, appropriate voltage uh, and uh, signals and timing in order to drive the power state of the AP safely. It also can provide the, um, the wake up signals to the AP. This is an example of an Intel SOC power sequence. Uh, this sequence is required to drive Comet Lake processor from G3 all the way to um, S0, passing through the intermediate sleep power state S5, S4, S3, and so forth. Um, on the left side, you can see that we're listing and describing uh, how, how all the power states that are supported um, from G3 all the way to S0. S0 is a state where uh, it's the AP is active and G3 is when it's completely off. Um, and this uh, diagram on the left side uh, is the one that shows all the, uh, the timings and the signals that are involved in this power sequence. This can be obtained, this is provided by Intel on the uh, platform design guide. And EC is the one that needs to adhere to, uh, be aware of this in order to provide the signals to the SOC. 
let's talk about the motivation for this proposal. In July 2021, Chromebooks switched from the original Google Chrome EC OS uh, to uh, an application based on the Cephal project. And given that the uh, AP power sequence is a predominant component uh, that was on this uh, Chrome EC uh, application, it makes sense to have something that follows the Cephal driver model. Um, this driver needs to be flexible uh, and provide routine, to be flexible to provide routines and make it reusable and easy to extend. This way, uh, new common designs will not require much code application uh, or function for definition. And also, we wanted to keep a, a structure that is easy to follow. Now, I will give an overview of the AP Power Sequence subsystem. So what is the uh, IP power sequence of system? Well, it's a software driver that runs on the EC and provides an underlying framework uh, for driving and monitoring AP power state. Each power state is logically bound to, uh, to state and the underlying framework. Although it's currently fit the x86 CPU uh, APs, it can be extended to other AP architectures. It's built on the Cephal State Machine Framework, and many of its features are leveraged. And each HCPI power state uh, has its present on this uh, on this subsystem has three uh, three levels of hierarchy. Uh, the architecture handles signals and voltages that are predominant on SOC with the same architecture uh, chipset uh, that is targeted for um, signals that are enabled in the SOC input and output modules. And application is for any topology uh, variant in terms of voltage and power rails. Um, I will give an example to that. So let's say that uh, for one platform design, uh, where a voltage range is monitored by an, an IC and sends the PG signal to the EC. Uh, and later, uh, we are required to reduce the bill of materials by removing this integrated circuit. And that way, EC has to do the monitoring itself, probably using a, a, an analog to digital converter. So the platform, this platform change can be addressed by this handler without having to change uh, the existing handler or impacting the existing handler for architecture and chipset. Um, uh, so this driver responds to events posted by other components uh, and the state machine implementation will process those events. That's the way it interacts. And by processing these events, uh, the state machine implementation can detect uh, AP power state transition and notify other components on the EC. Uh, so an example, let's say that um, uh, I want to keep a sensor voltage rail on only while the AP is uh, fully active. This means that it's on S0. Uh, to achieve this, we can uh, register uh, a callback to be notified uh, when entering into the S0. And this callback, I can turn on this power rail. And also, I will register another callback that will uh, notify when uh, exceeding in from S0 power state. So that way, I can turn down uh, this voltage rail and I can save power. It also supports uh, additional power states. Uh, this is this depends on the application if more power states or substates are required. Since I have mentioned that this subsystem is built on the Cephal State Machine Framework, uh, I would like to explain its operation. In this example, I have defined two uh, parent states, PS1 and PS2, and three child states. State 1 and S2 are child state of PS1, and S3 is a child state of uh, PS2. Each state has its functions defined for entry, run, and exit. So first, the state machine execution is initiated by setting an initial state. Uh, this will position the state machine in that state and call the entry functions in descending hierarchy order. 
This means that the parent state, its entry function is called first, and then the child state entry function. Later, uh, one iteration is uh, executed by calling the uh, this API, and this will call the uh, current state run function in ascending order. That means uh, the state one run, that's the child state, and then the parent state run. In the next uh, run iteration, uh, state one run does a transition into S2, and this calls the exit function uh, for S1 and the entry function for S2. Yeah. This call is done in ascending order, but since S1 and S2 are sharing the same parent, uh, that parent entry and exit function is not called. Um, and as I mentioned, the entry functions are called in descending order, same and same as the step one. And at this point, we are in the state S2. And then uh, next iteration takes place and uh, state two uh, does a transition into S3. And since S2 and S3 uh, have different parent, now the corresponding entry and exit functions are called in the expected order ascending for exit calls and descending for entry calls. And this can be shown in the following picture. Uh, we can see that the state uh, one and state two are child states of PS1 and S3 is the child state for S2, for PS2. And we can see the arrows, uh, what was the, the flow of the transitions. Now that I've mentioned how Sephiroth state machine framework works, uh, I can continue with the power sequence state machine. Uh, so the hierarchical state machine is enabled. It's one of the features that we are using from the Sephiroth state machine framework. Uh, this will coordinate for us uh, the execution of the entry, run, and exit functions. Uh, Sephir State Machine Framework APIs are not directly accessed. They are wrapped and, uh, and some other features are enabled. And also the implementation can access the macros and these APIs. Only the implementation can access those. Uh, this way we are ensuring that the hierarchy is uh, maintained. And here, is, here we can see uh, three HPI states uh, with the corresponding uh, state machine handlers, including uh, the, uh, the hierarchy that I mentioned previously. Now let's go over the execution flow. So here is the AP power sequence and it's interacting with uh, these three components. So initially, uh, the AP power sequence is not running. Um, however, callback registration can take place. Now uh, the application one uh, starts the AP power sequence. And in order to start it, it needs to set an initial state, an initial power state, and this will call the corresponding entry function. And at this point, there is no iteration made. Iterations are triggered by posting events into the AP power sequence. This will call the current event current power state run function and the event will be visible to that uh, to that function. Uh, if a power state transition occurs, the corresponding entry and exit functions are called in the hierarchical order that we previously described. And after that the power sequence will go through the all the notifications that are registered and it will find those that meet the criterion. And the criterion it will follow is that either uh, it will entry or exit a specific um, power state. And after that, there is one more iteration that is made. And if there is no transition happening, the AP power sequence thread will go back to sleep. And again, it will wait for any event to be posted.
Now let's talk about uh, how to provide an implementation for the AP Power Sequence subsystem. These are the macros that are used for providing the action handlers uh, for entry, run, and exit. Uh, the first parameter uh, is the name of the state, the power state that they want to provide, and then the corresponding functions. Uh, note that there is one macro available for each hierarchy level, one for application, one for chipset, and one for uh, architecture. These macros are mandatory. They need to be provided at least to if we want to uh, use uh, the implement the power the AP power sequence. And these are optional. There is only work when a substate is, uh, is is set on the device tree. These are the APIs that are available for the implementation. Uh, this API helps to uh, set the next state or query some information for where to know what is the entry or the exit function. And also this way, uh, the events that are posted can be also checked. Uh, this, this set event is only meant to be called for the run functions. As we will see later, only one uh, state transitions is permitted per iteration. These uh, functions uh, will get what is the state that is entering or exiting. And these are only available to for entry and exit functions. If this is called inside a run functions, it will return an error. And this function will uh, is, is meant to be used uh, to query if the if the event is set. And this can be used in all the uh, action handled functions. Here, I would like to show how macros and APIs come into play. For this example, I'm uh, defining three power states. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm just providing run functions for each one. First, uh, S5, here you can see how the macros are used to provide architecture, chipset, and application level power state run action handlers. Now I define S4 um, and S3. This is how the state machine diagram would look. You can see that action handles were not defined for application level on S4 and for architecture level on S3. This doesn't represent an issue, uh, the hierarchy and execution order is maintained. Uh, just the level not defined will be omitted from execution. Um, inside the corresponding run function, implementation is expected to, provide, to program the logic that fits with the power state it's representing. Uh, for example, S4, uh, say that some power signal was expected to be asserted and for some reason it's not and then you say okay there's something wrong so I need to go back to uh, S5 and that's what it, it will do. Uh, this way uh, the power state are, in, are synchronized with the AP power state and the arrows denote the possible path the implementation sets uh, for the state machine and, and the order and signals uh, are set by the AP vendor and need to be shared uh, and no by the implementation and some signed document. In this quick example, I'm showing how the entry and exit functions work. Uh, when a state transition is made, these functions are executed in specific hierarchical order. First, the current state exit functions are called in ascending order. This is application level, chipset, then architecture. And then the next state in descending order, architecture, chipset, and application. The get entry state function, that one return the next state in the transition. And the get exit state returns the current state, the state it is exceeding. Uh, these APIs are meant to be called only inside implementation of the entry and exit functions. Otherwise, it will return error. Uh, further state transitions are not allowed inside these functions. Only the run functions implementation are allowed to do transitions. This is to avoid uh, any stack overflow because these functions run in, in the stack. Another feature of this subsystem is the ultimate hook pattern. Uh, this allows upper level action handlers to finalize the current iteration execution flow by returning non-zero. 
Uh, this way, implementation can be overridden or complemented in different levels. If non-zero is returned from application, action handlers, chipset, and architectures are not call, called for that iteration. And similar thing happens with the chipset. The architecture will not be called. Um, this also applies to exit and entry functions implementation. So all of them uh, support this ultimate pattern. This example only has the run, but yeah, as I said, entry and exit uh, follow the same. It is possible to add forged states, although only at application and chipset level. Uh, in this example, I created additional substates for providing uh, action handlers. I uh, use the corresponding macros. Um, and I specify uh, one more value, which is uh, the, the, the parent state. Uh, when additional stairs are, states are provided, uh, its definition is to be complemented using the device tree. And this device tree will, uh, will define the enumeration ID. Um, this, this is how um, the state will look with additional substates. And, and again, the, the arrows denote the possible path. And you can see the three additional states with different color. And you can see how they are inside you know, the application level or the chipset level. Now let's talk about the user interface and the services that are provided. Users of this system have access to all these functions. Uh, on top, we have the function to get the device reference, uh, followed by the API to query the current state and to get the string name of the state. This is for debugging purposes. Uh, then we have uh, the APIs for start, the execution, and post events into the subsystem. Uh, user can also lock. Uh, locking will prevent the thread from running. Uh, events can still be posted, but they will not be processed until, until unlocked. And finally, those functions to register callbacks when entering or exiting certain power state. And these are the enumerations available for power states and events that can be posted. Uh, note that the additional state's name will be resolved during the build time using the device tree. This is why we have this for each status OK of the power substates. And also the callback requires to use this uh, structure that will include the, call, the name of the callback function and the a bit mask for each power state that we want to enable. This is a quick example of how user register power state callbacks. The callback functions prototype includes the device reference, entry state, and the exit state. This helps user to know where the state machine is going in the transition. Uh, func functions user entry callback is expected to be called during transitions where the state machine enters G3, S3, and S0, and function user exit callback is expected in transitions where uh, the state machine exits G3, S4, and S2. And finally, let's do a summary of this presentation. Power state execution needs to be started with a designated power state. State machine does not process any event until this happens. Any user can start the state machine. Implementation notifications are executed within driver instance thread context. Keep this in mind to avoid deadlocks or uh, on your registered callbacks. Only implementations do state transitions. This is to prevent any bug or race condition. Transitions can only be triggered by run action handlers. This promotes a, an order state machine flow. Only one state transition is permitted per iteration. Entry and exit functions consume stack. Uh, we want to avoid any overflow and this also promotes an order state machine flow. Transitioning into state with no action handlers implemented at any level will result on blocking the state machine execution indefinitely. Implementation needs to provide uh, always uh, a state machine action handlers and also needs to set possible next states, otherwise it will be 
stuck in the, in the same state. Uh, it is recommended to lock power state when performing operation based on current power state. This will avoid, avoid any race condition between state machine and implementation itself. And always remember to unlock the power state from the user perspective, otherwise you will not do anything else. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this was of interest to you.